I am the Evolutionary and Ecology Biology program. He joined the UCLA from, from Berkeley and he's doing a lot of cool work in population genetics. And today he's going to be talking about just part of that cool work. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, yes, so, um, so I'm going to get started telling you about some of our new work on uh, distributions of um, fitness effects. So mutation is the ultimate source of genetic variation in populations. And there's tremendous interest in trying to figure out the effects that mutations have on fitness, on, on reproductive fitness. And there are a number of different ways one could go about estimating fitness effects of uh, new mutations. And what I'm showing you here is sort of an experimental approach to addressing the, or to understanding fitness effects of mutations. And there's a large body of literature on these sorts of mutation accumulation uh, type of experiments where the basic idea is you start with some ancestral line. This could be whatever your favorite model organism is, maybe yeast or some kind of uh, bacterial species. And the idea is as you make these independent lines, you let them evolve over some number of generations. They accumulate mutations. And then at the end of this experiment, you essentially, you can either compete them against each other or do some other assay to look at um, growth and, 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 and fitness uh, from these mutation accumulation lines. And the idea is, is it in typical laboratory conditions, oftentimes you find that these mutation accumulation lines have lower fitness at the end of the experiment compared to the ancestral line. And that suggests that many spontaneous mutations that occur in organisms tend to be deleterious. And so here's just an example summarizing the fitness effects of, of mutations from one of these types of mutation accumulation experiments in yeast. And you can see that some of these Mutations will tend to you know, essentially have no effect on fitness, meaning the relative fitness is one or essentially equivalent to what you had in the ancestral line. And in other cases, fitness is very, very low, indicating many um, deleterious mutations. And so there's some um, theory and methodological work that's been done where you can take the output of this kind of experiment and actually look at the mean reduction in fitness as well as the variance in uh, fitness among lines and use that in a statistical framework to estimate this distribution of fitness effects of new mutations. In other words, estimate the proportions of mutations that are strongly deleterious versus those that are, that are neutral. And so you know, that seems like a pretty successful paradigm to, or towards assessing fitness effects of, of new mutations. However, despite the success of these approaches, there's some difficulties with this type of experimental or laboratory-based <coughs> framework. So one uh, difficulty is that it's difficult to measure the effects on fitness of uh, weakly deleterious mutations. In other words, the precision with which we can quantify fitness effects in these mutation accumulation lines is still uh, a bit limited. And thus, we then can't assess the effects of uh, weakly deleterious mutations on, um, on fitness. And so that's a big limitation. A second limitation is right, that these organisms are, are uh, grown up and studied in a laboratory environment and not their natural sort of habitat. The extent to which that influences our ability to accurately quantify fitness effects in natural populations, I think, remains an open question. And last, but, and perhaps most obviously, but I would argue uh, perhaps also most importantly, that there are limitations to studying these uh, uh, sort of quote unquote lower organisms in, in laboratory lines. In other words, you're, you, you can only study certain organisms in this system. You know, many of the organisms that we're very interested in, say our own species, uh, humans, as well as dogs, wolves, other sorts of species of, of tremendous ecological and, and anthropological interest, well, the ex you can't study those in this sort of laboratory line framework. And the extent to which these other species, the, the DFE, or distribution of fitness effects, estimated in these other species apply to species like humans remains an open question. So that this all begs the question, are there other approaches to studying fitnesses, fitness effects of new mutations that aren't limited in the way that some of these experimental evolution studies might be? And so, of course, uh, since I'm giving this talk, the answer is yes, and it's using a uh, population genetic approach to study fitness effects of, uh, of new mutations. And the basic idea behind this is, is fairly simple that I'll introduce now and then sort of go through for the next uh, three hours, I mean uh, 45 minutes or so, uh, the details of, of sort of how this, how this actually works. But the basic idea is the following. As we study genetic variation from some sort of natural population, whatever you're sort of interested in, and there's some class of sites in that genome that we're interested in. For this talk, it'll be non-synonymous sites. These are sites in coding regions where mutations that occur at them change the encoded amino acid. But in principle, this framework could be applied to other categories of, of uh, for example, non-coding elements or that sort of thing. 
But the basic idea is, is you have some class of sites that you're interested in, and you want to estimate the DFE or distribution of fitness effects for. And so the idea is, is that the observed patterns of genetic variation from the natural population, they're the outcome of the evolutionary process. So in other words, they're the outcome of this process of population history and demography, as well as natural selection. And so what we can do is, is look at the observed patterns of variation and then fit a model to that that includes the effects of, uh, includes a distribution of fitness effects as well as demographic <coughs> history. And so we can find the parameters of the distribution of fitness effects that essentially maximizes the probability of seeing the, the observed data. So that's the basic paradigm that, um, that we'll be operating under. And this is, of course, not a new idea. There's been a, you know, a lot of work in this area in the past. Um, so here I'm showing an example of a uh, well-cited paper, uh, this paper by Boyko et al. in 2008, that used this type of framework to estimate the distribution of fitness effects of new uh, amino acid changing or non-synonymous mutations in humans. And this is essentially what, th what they came up with, is this distribution of fitness effects. So the way to read this is, right, this is essentially a histogram of, of different fitness effects on the x-axis. These would be the strongly deleterious mutations, which have a fitness effect bigger than 1%. These would be the essentially mildly deleterious or nearly neutral mutations that have a fitness effect of less than 10 to the minus fourth. And then these would be in the middle here. And so what they, uh, through a model-based framework that, I'll, again, I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes, what, what they came up with was that there's about 35% of new amino acid changing mutations in humans are estimated to be strongly deleterious, nearly 30% are nearly neutral, and the rest sort of fall somewhere, somewhere in the middle. So that's, that's the estimate of, of distribution of fitness effects for, for humans. This was published a number of years ago. And if you go on Google Scholar, right, you can see this thing is, this paper's been cited nearly 400 times uh, since that time. And the reason why this paper, I think, is, is so widely cited and is sort of the motivation for work in this area is that this distribution of fitness effects, it's a really critical parameter for much of population genetics. And I would argue biology as a whole that this is one of the most important distributions in all of biology. It's critical to addressing many areas of, of evolutionary interest from basic questions that sort of remain elusive even to this uh, day where we're sort of inundated with, with genetic variation data across species. So it's, the DFE is critical to addressing things like what determines genetic diversity in species. You know, is, if variation it tends to be very deleterious, well, then you're going to see less variation than if it's, it's essentially neutral. So it's a, it's a key null model for that. Additionally, some of the early work uh, from, from Kimura and Oda in the 1960s and 70s on, on the distribution of fitness effects related to questions pertaining to the molecular clock. And it turns out that the distributions of fitness effects and how that varies across species is actually really important for determining whether the extent to which substitutions in different lineages accumulate in a clock-like fashion. Uh, another theory about how, uh, how recombination may have evolved was that its selection can more effic effectively purge deleterious mutations if you have lots of recombination. So the extent to which those models actually you know, uh, apply in, in different populations and how important they are, it's dependent on how many deleterious mutations are occurring in natural populations. Similarly, the amount of adaptive evolution is obviously a key question in, in all of uh, population genetics. People are very interested in this. And at, at the heart of that, the distribution of fitness effects is important, both for adaptive mutations, you know, what proportion of mutations may be adaptive, but also for having null models to, uh, from which you can identify uh, or use to compare your data against to, to try to figure out how many mutations may be adaptive. Lastly, um, the, the distribution of fitness effect is, impor uh, is important for understanding and quantifying uh, genetic differences in genetic load across populations. For those of you who were at my talk uh, a couple weeks ago where we looked at fitness effects in dogs and wolves and how demographic history may have affected that, right, having accurate models of the distribution of fitness effects is, is really fundamental to being able to, to do that. But even if you don't like evolution at all, and, and, and I mean, hopefully you believe in it, but even if you don't find it interesting or important, there's actually a, a large part of medical genetics uh, is, is um, is, um, rests upon, I would say, um, having accurate estimates of the distribution of fitness effects. So for example, the extent to which you know, a lot of the uh, variation in common uh, disease risk, whether that's due to rare mutations versus more common variants, right, that's in large part determined by, among other things, the distribution of, of fitness effects. And as a co both as a consequence of that and for other uh, reasons that the optimal sort of strategies for finding genes is so implicated in, in disease risk and then you know, the, whether you should the, the types of study design and, and the um, particular statistical models used in your uh, rare variant association tests, 
many of those questions relate back indirectly or directly to the uh, distribution of fitness effects. So it's a really fundamental parameter in, in much of, of, of I'd say, modern, modern genetics. And so you might say, well, OK, we, we have this, this uh, Boyko et al. study. It, it's, you know, it's a quite, quite solid paper. Um, it's been well cited. You know, so is, is this actually a solved, solved question? And even for a species like humans, and we'll talk about other species um, in, in a few minutes, but uh, like any study, right, and, and as well, Boyko et al. We made very substantial advances in, in this area. That study has, has a number of limitations, and not the least of which was that this was a study that was essentially ahead of its time, but it used this fairly old uh, data set that, again, at the time was, was pretty big, but not by today's standards. The Boyko et al. study looked at essentially coding regions of about 10,000 genes. This is from old school Sanger PCR-based resequencing, so no next-gen sequencing. But they studied this in about 15 African-American um, individuals. And so what, might, what effect might that have on, on the ability to estimate the distribution of fitness effects? Well, both population genetic theory and maybe just basic intuition would suggest that, well, really strongly deleterious mutations are probably going to be at low frequency in the population. And then the chances that they're actually segregating in the sample of 15 individuals is probably quite, quite remote. And um, so what that then means is, is that you'll have limited power to actually be able to say, well, what's going on with strongly deleterious versus moderately deleterious mutations? And so you might say, well, Boyko et al. You know, inferred that. So how, how could they do it from such a small sample? And the answer is, is that what they, what they did was you could fit a parametric distribution, typically like a gamma distribution or a log normal distribution. You can fit that to the distribution of fitness effects based on essentially the nearly neutral or the very mildly deleterious mutations. And then from that distribution, extrapolate what's going on at the more strongly deleterious tail of things. And, uh, so in other words, that, that uh, inference is coming from the functional form of the distribution assumed rather than directly from the data. And just to sort of drive this, this point home here, what, what this is showing is, is in a sample size of 24 chromosomes, right, these are SNPs at different frequencies, or excuse me, these are the graph represents the number of SNPs that we might expect to see. So this is for predictions from a model here, but the number of SNPs that we might expect to see at different frequencies um, in a sample of size 24 chromosomes. So it's a small sample like what was used in, in the Boyko study. And so if we just, for example, look at the singletons, so these are variants found in frequency 1 out of 24 in our sample. And what the different colors represent would be, assuming the Boyko et al. distribution of fitness effects is, is, is true and is capturing you know, the, the, the true DFE, what proportion of these segregating variants would we, or what number rather, would we expect to see having different fitness effects? And so the red ones would be the, the really strongly deleterious mutations, the blue ones would be the essentially moderately deleterious, and so on and so forth, where the orange ones are essentially nearly neutral. And so what you see is, even if you look at the really rare ones in the sample, these, these uh, the singletons, what you see is probably more than 80% of them are essentially nearly neutral or, or uh, only weakly deleterious. And you have just a smidgen here of, of these uh, strongly deleterious ones and a, still a small number of the moderately deleterious ones. And so the idea is, is you're essentially seeing almost only neutral variation segregating in your sample, and that can limit the ability to say something about strongly deleterious variants. Yeah? But this graph you're showing us now essentially is a way to estimate the proportion from the data, right? so yeah, well, that's, that's the whole point behind this. That, so we'll. That doesn't rely on assuming a parametric distribution. That, that's just, uh, uh, I mean, you could invert, you, you, could, you could observe the empirical distribution in your data and invert this uh, sort of non parametric relationship you're showing us here and get estimates that don't rely, don't rely on. Uh, I they may not be very good. You can you can get the advantage. But but so so the problem though is is whether you know those you have those strongly deleterious ones versus the, the blue ones, that's still determined by the functional form of the of the distribution. In other words, the point is is you get very few mutations actually segregating in your sample. And so if you don't see them in your sample, then you could say that they have to be more deleterious than some amount given this. I agree with that. But then how much more deleterious than you're limited? Well, that, that, that logic, you'll see that logic comes through in the actual inference method. Um, but since that time, um, there have been more um, 
there have been more uh, deeper samples of, uh, of individuals studied with, with more modern data sets. One example here is this paper by Lee et al. in 2010 that looked at exome sequencing data of 200 variants, or excuse me, 200 uh, Danish exomes, and they also inferred a distribution of fitness effects. And their distribution of fitness effects is what's shown here in the, uh, in the blue bars. And compared to in red is the Boyko et al. distribution we were just talking about. And then in green here is the distribution inferred from a different paper from, from Adam Airwalker. And what you can see here is you don't really need a statistical test of any sort to see that these distributions, in particular the Lee et al. one, is substantially different than the Boyko et al. one, where now nearly all of the mutations, nearly 80%, have these moderately, are moderately deleterious. And you see virtually no strongly deleterious uh, mutations uh, in the data. And so obviously, you could say, well, there's, there's then some issue in terms of which distribution of fitness effects is, is accurate, you know, accurately um, describing what's, what's going on um, in, in the population. And so I would argue this is still an evolving area of, of research. And in my talk today, I'm going to focus on three different sort of topics. The first is more of a tutorial, giving an overview, but with a bit more detail and a bit more specifics than sort of what I've given so far, about how one can infer the distribution of fitness effects from genetic variation data in, in this sort of model-based framework. Then second, address the question I sort of just raised in terms of what is actually is the distribution of fitness effects in humans, and how can we use leverage more large data sets, uh, of, uh, sort of more modern sequencing data sets to address that. And then lastly is, is a, a sort of different, fundamentally different question, sort of moving outside of humans and assuming some parametric functional form, but actually looking at what sort of, you know, the, realizing that the distribution of fitness effects is the outcome of the evolutionary process itself, and actually try to assess, well, what, uh, what factors are driving the uh, uh, evolution of the distribution of fitness effects. So first, I'll start by uh, giving sort of an overview of some different computational approaches to infer the distribution of fitness effects from uh, genetic variation data. And like many, but certainly not all things in population genetics, this sort of starts with what's called the site frequency spectrum. You've seen a number of probably similar slides several times uh, throughout this, uh, this conference. But just by way of quick review, so we're all on the same page, I'm going to go through it again. The basic idea is the data we have looks something like this, where each row here is a particular haplotype or a particular sequence. The columns denote variable sites in the genome. And so this is the multi-sequence alignment. And so you can essentially look at each of these. So here's one position in the genome where there's a SNP. And in these five chromosomes, you see that the ancestral allele, which is the allele that the chimp would have, for example, for thinking about human data, and the red allele would be the, the alternate or mutant allele here. And so if you look across here, you see that there's a frequency one out of five, uh, or the, excuse me, derived allele has frequency one out of five. At the second site, the derived allele has frequency two out of five, and so on and so forth. So you can simply calculate the frequency of each SNP. And then what we can do is summarize those counts in this histogram here. And that's what the, what's called the site frequency spectrum. So for example, we see that there are one, two, three, four, five sites that have frequency one out of five. So at this bin here, the singletons, right, that has height five, indicating that there are five SNPs in our data that have frequency one out of five. If we move on to the doubletons, so these are SNPs that have frequency two out of five. You see that there are two of them. Tripletons, you see that there are three of them. And we see that in this particular data set, there are no SNPs at frequency four out of five. So the idea is, is you could simply make this histogram uh, for the number, uh, for, the, for the data. And that's a summary of, or summary statistic of the genetic variation data. And if the SNPs actually are independent of each other, then it turns out this is actually a sufficient statistic for, for the data. In other words, all of the information about the parameters contained in the sequence data is captured within the site frequency spectrum. If it's not, if the SNPs are not independent of each other, then you lose uh, information about the correlation structure or linkage to equilibrium. Five also, five also so we don't, we don't count fixed sites here. We condition them that they're segregating. But fixed and derived would be informative. They can be, but the problem with that is, is then you, you, you um, need models that accurately quantify the divergence across species. So it does contain, I agree it contains information, but it turns out that um, the, prob the practical problems of doing reliable inference that that introduces outweighs the information gained from, from looking at it. If you're trying to study deleterious effects, if you're trying to study uh, adaptive evolution where you could have positive selection and fixed sites, then you do get extra information from that. Okay, so the, the idea here is, is that, so why, would we, why might we be interested in looking at the frequency spectrum? It turns out that it's actually very heavily influenced by, uh, among other things, 
the uh, effects of purifying selection. So what I'm showing here, this is a neutral site frequency spectrum for some demographic model. And then as we move over to the right side of the plot, there tends to be more and more stronger and stronger uh, purifying selection or mutations become more and more deleterious. And what you notice as you've moved from here to here, you should notice two different things, right? One is, is that you see the heights of the bars become much smaller and, and, oh, as you move over here. And that means there's just fewer variants segregating in the sample as mutations become more deleterious. That should intuitively make a lot of sense because deleterious mutations are getting selected out. The second thing you should notice is that of the variants that are left, Nearly all of them, or a large proportion of them, tend to be in the singleton category, or they tend to be very rare. Whereas in the neutral case, yes, you're right, the mode is still singletons, but there's a you know, number of, of more, more common variants. And those all seem to be the first to go away. And again, that intuitively makes sense, because the deleterious variants, even if they're segregating, they're likely to be at low frequency. And that's what you actually um, see here. So there's information contained both in the number of SNPs in the, in the frequency spectrum, as well as in the curvature, or the skew, of, of the frequency spectrum here. And the idea is, is, is what these different frequency spectra look like. In other words, what the, what the frequency spectrum uh, looks like, it's determined by but this, what we consider the strength of selection, which is at little s, the selection coefficient that we've been talking about, as well as the population size, because that influences the amount of genetic drift that also plays a role at shaping these uh, frequency spectra. So the basic idea here is, is that when we have actual um, data, we could look, for example, at the genome-wide uh, site frequency spectrum of a class of variants that we think could be neutrally evolving, for example, synonymous sites, and use that to gauge, essentially, or fit a demographic model that um, captures the, the, the de demographic history and allows us to set a baseline standard for what we think neutral evolution would look like, and then look at the site frequency spectrum of a second category of sites, namely, say, the non-synonymous SNPs or the amino acid changing ones, and that's likely to be a mixture of these different frequency spectra with some neutral ones and some you know, mildly deleterious and some strongly deleterious variants. And so it's a mixture of all of them together. And then we can use, essentially try to use this to infer parameters in some type of distribution of uh, fitness effects. So in order for that conceptual uh, framework to actually work in practice, we need sort of at least two things. So first, we need a way to generate the expected site frequency spectrum in a sample, which I'm going to call this E for expected value and XI as the number of SNPs at frequency I in our sample. So we need a way to come up with that for a given model of demography and selection, or, or, or DFE. And the second thing that we need is a way to actually assess the fit of this pr uh, frequency spectrum from the model to, the, to our actual observed data. So those are the two ingredients that, that we need. And what I, the approach that we're going to use uh, to address this is what's uh, uh, essentially captured in this uh, Poisson random field model. And it works something like this. The basic idea is, is that it's a model of evolution that each generation you have a Poisson number of mutations enter the, the population with rate theta over 2. So theta here is, is your typical theta in population genetics for a mu. Uh, it's the population scaled mutation rate. So you get theta over two mutations enter the population each generation. They're all assumed to be independent of each other. That's a key uh, feature here. And the idea is each of these mutations, which is symbolized here by a, you know, a, a single curve, each of them follows a Wright Fisher model of evolution. And that means that they change in frequency from generation to generation, as you see here, essentially following uh, deterministically by natural selection and stochastically by, by genetic drift. So Sriram and uh, Amelia gave introductions to the Wright-Fisher model. That process is applying here on each site individually. And the idea is, is now we have a ton of these uh, undergoing uh, evolution, and all independently um, of each other. And so the idea is, is why, you know, why, why would you want to do it this way? Well, so you can write down some elegant theory for what you actually would expect to see. And so I'll walk you through sort of how this works. What, this is the thing we want to find here from the model, right? The expected number of SNPs at frequency i in our sample. This is what we want to find as a function of a bunch of parameters here, so, or given the parameters. So this thing here I'm calling theta d. That we're saying is our model of demography. So theta can be like a vector of, of demographic parameters. So these can be like population size changes, whatever, whatever you want. And this theta DFE, that's our distribution of fitness effects. So if, if we assume a gamma distribution, right, these would be the shape and scale parameters. It could be, you know, it could be a number of bins for like an arbitrary distribution of fitness effects. It's whatever it, we want it to be. We'll keep it general right now. So this is saying 
so what, we're, what we can write down is the expected number of SNPs given essentially the model that includes both demography and selection. And so that's going to be a function of all of this stuff. And I'll walk you through what the different pieces are because each one of them can conveys, contains some meaning about what, what we're doing here. So this first part here that I'm showing in purple, this is essentially the, the distribution of gamma. So gamma here is the 2NS, it's a set, the population scaled selection coefficient. So essentially, this is a particular value uh, or particular selection coefficient given the distribution of fitness effects. So in other words, this is essentially just looking at a, a, essentially like a, if you want to think about a parametric distribution, this could be like a gamma distribution or a log normal distribution here. And the idea is, is we're going to essentially numerically integrate over this distribution of fitness effects. And I'll tell you a bit more about how, how we do that in a, more specifically in a few slides. But the basic idea is, is we can say, OK, we have this distribution of uh, selection coefficients. Let's take one of those, denoted here by, by the gamma. And then let's go over to the second part. So what this is is saying, this is the probability of having some allele frequency in the population, x, given the demographic model, whatever that, that is, and the selection coefficient. So just a single selection coefficient and a demographic model. What's the probability that you see really rare variants, more common variants, et cetera, in the population? And the way, so the way that this is typically calculated is by, right, you could simulate this um, you know, under the right Fisher model. One could simulate this, but that's, you know, unless you have a ton of com computing power, it's, it's really not, not practical. And so what's typically done is this is approximated with diffusion equations to continuously model the uh, allele frequency change uh, over, over time. And for constant population size, there's actually some closed form solutions for this. But for changing population sizes and more complicated tomography, there's typically a numerical solution to the diffusion equation that gets this probability distribution here. So that's the population allele frequency x. But keep in mind, what are we interested in? We're interested in the frequency in our sample, frequency i in our sample from the population. So what we then do is, is say, OK, well, there's a, add in a binomial sampling step here given the uh, allele frequency in the population x, it's simple binomial sample or binomial probability to get us to count, to count i. And then we integrate over the um, you know, x from 0 to 1, right? Because x is a proportion here, or uh, frequency, whereas i is an integer count. And lastly, we have just the expected number of mutations entering the population every generation, right? The, so this is a way we can sort of compute this in a fancy way. Again, if you wanted, you could actually simulate this forward in time if you had infinite computing power. So these are all, the fancy stuff is just really tricks to be able to, to compute this in an efficient way. Yeah, why is the gamma distribution? So the idea here is, it turns out there's some nice, this can also be used for, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. You could scale it as the ancestral or the current. Um, it's sort of up to you um, because you're including that change in size in, in the model. So, so the idea is when you actually fit it, right, it, you get some fit that's then arbitrarily scaled and you choose how to separate out n from s based on the population size later. Yeah, so you can in other words, you can estimate gamma without any assumptions of the population size. And then to convert that into S, then, then um, you need to pick one, either the current or the ancestral. So it turns out that the, um, each entry then of the site frequency spectrum will follow a Poisson distribution with rate equal to what we just went over on the previous slide. And so that then means, right, we can sort of simply do likelihood inference on the frequency spectrum using a Poisson likelihood function here where x is sort of the vector of the, the whole frequency spectrum. And then the xi here is, right, our observed number of SNPs in our data at frequency i. This is what we computed on the previous slide. And the idea is we then multiply over the different bins of the frequency spectrum or if we're working in log space as we typically would do sum it over for the log likelihoods. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we're not integrating over i. No, no, no. So we we multiply. So we take each bin. No, we integrate over x. Because right, you can have one. You can have like say x. Let's say x is one percent. Right, that can give rise to different counts, and and or said the other way, things that are singletons could have different frequencies in the population, and so that's why we integrate over x. Okay. 
Yeah, so this, was, this is just for one particular value of i. And the idea is, is we would do this for i from 1 to n minus 1. And the idea is then we, right, because we were interested in the likelihood of the, the whole frequency spectrum, all of the bins. I mean, so one could do this for a particular bin, but you want to do it. Yeah, exactly. And so the key idea here is this likelihood function uses information both about the number of SNPs, right? That's coming in into, these, uh, into the mutation rate on the previous slide, as well as the curvature of the frequency spectrum. So the relative proportions of, sing say, things where i equals 1, the singletons versus i equals 2, the doubletons, uh, and so on and so forth. So both of those come into play here. And that gives some additional power uh, to, to infer the DFE. So the basic idea is, is then we can optimize the, the likelihood function. A few more, more details here, right? So we have this, this theta d, right? Remember, that's the demographic model. Uh, the way that this is typically in, uh, implemented, and this is not our idea, it was published uh, probably Williamson 2005 was one of, the, I'd say, the key references on, on this. But the basic idea is, is you take a class of sites you believe to be neutrally evolving, like synonymous sites, and fit the demographic model. And so you come up with maximum likelihood estimates of the demographic parameters. And then condition on the MLEs do the inference of, of selection. And it turns out, and I'm happy to chat after, but there's under uh, a variety of conditions, this, as long as your demographic model fits the putatively neutral sites pretty well, then that approach actually works, works really well uh, under a number of you know, fairly pathological conditions. Um, and so that's, that's a good thing. Um, and so the idea then is, is, and it makes the inference much easier, because then you don't have to jointly infer um, selection and demography um, together. And so this theta DFE, right, we can use different functional forms for it. And that's what I'll tell you about in, the, uh, in, in a bit. Um, but typically, people in the past have used gamma log normal probably were the most popular um, distributions. So given that approach, we can address the question, what's the DFE for new uh, non-synonymous mutations in humans? And our goal here is to leverage some of the you know, new large data sets, like 1,000 genomes or the NHLBI exome sequencing project or uh, the LUCAMP exome sequencing data. You know, there's more and more of these coming online every day. We want to leverage that to estimate the DFE. And you know, one sort of tricky thing is the existing approaches that sort of implement some of the stuff I just went over on the previous few slides, they actually have some issues when thinking about really big samples or when applying them. So PR Freak, the program uh, developed in Boyko et al., it, it runs into problems when using large samples. Uh, there's another method from Adam Airwalker and Peter Keatley called DFE Alpha. And this, uh, for various features of the model and what goes on under, under the hood, it can only model one population size change. And so that's problematic when you're thinking about large samples where you now have to worry about what's going on with recent demographic history. In other words, recent demography, many populations seem to be expanding. And for this type of complex non-equilibrium demography, DFE alpha can't really um, you know, handle it. Another program called uh, Daddy from Ryan Gu uh, Gutenkunst, um, that can handle large samples, which is great. But the standard implementation, um, and I will say a few more words about this in a second, it can really only generate the site frequency spectrum for a single value of gamma uh, or 2ns efficiently. And so that provides some, uh, or has some limitations when thinking about trying to estimate stuff for a, uh, or parameters of a DFE. And so our solution to this was to uh, develop a, a series of Python modules for a package that we call um, Fit Daddy. And this, as I'll explain in a few minutes, how we can integrate over a distribution of fitness effects fairly efficiently. We include many different DFEs, including um, some, some uh, mixture distributions and arbitrary point mass. There's some tricks for um, optimizing some of these um, mixture distributions. And there's also some computational speed ups by leveraging um, computing things on multiple processors. So this is the work of Bernard Kim, a graduate student in, in, my, uh, in my group, who largely developed this. And though we named the program uh, Fit Daddy, it's not meant to be named after uh, Bernard. Uh, so what's the main um, speed up here in, in Fit Daddy compared to Daddy? So the basic idea is, is the initial implementation of Daddy uses the following approach. So if you imagine we have some distribution of fitness effects we want to optimize. So let, let's, let's say a gamma distribution, for example. And we start with some parameters, you know, shape and scale of the gamma distribution. And the way that we numerically integrate over that gamma distribution is that we'll take a bunch of different values of 2ns. And for each one of those, solve the, numerically solve the diffusion equation to get the frequency spectrum. And then the idea is, is then we essentially weight those together based on the probability 
distribution that we're considering over here. So if you're thinking about just one specific distribution, like a particular um, you know, shape and scale parameter, this works you know, fine. Um, the problem is, is the existing implementation then, when you then go to consider a second set of parameters, so say now you're searching over the space of, of shape and scale parameters for your gamma distribution, you essentially go back and recompute all this stuff again for the second set of parameter values and the third one and so on and so forth. So you're actually re essentially solving the diffusion equation over and over again for each of these different updates on your, your DFE and this actually is the computationally intensive part of the whole process. And it, as, as you might imagine, ends up being quite, quite slow when you're considering a lot of different distributions or want to search over the, the parameter space. And so what we do is sort of something pretty basic, and the idea was outlined in, in the, actually in the Boyko paper, but it wasn't applied within this, this particular framework, is we simply do this step first where we consider you know, the grid of values of 2NS and essentially then save them in memory or in a, and or in a file. And then what we can do is simply go back in the lookup table and, and reweight these different SFSs in, based on what we get out of the DFE. And so we're not essentially doing these same computations over and over again. And that results in a considerable speed up uh, to the whole process, as, as you might imagine. So this slide here is just to show off that the method actually works reasonably well um, on, on simulated data with some sort of bizarre distributions. I mean, we did a lot of other simulations too, but I just want to highlight um, these two examples here. So the way this works, right, this is the different bins of the frequency spectrum here on the x-axis, the heights show the proportion of mutations falling in those bins. The red dots indicate the true values. And the idea here is what we wanted to do is look at some distributions where you know, there's very few of these sort of moderately deleterious mutations, but then a lot more of the strongly deleterious, and then another one where we sort of flip those two. And so you get these sort of multimodal uh, distributions here. And the, the box plots show the uh, distribution of the estimates on, on the simulated data sets. And what you can see is that they you know, work really, really well at uh, matching up with the red dots. In other words, we can recover the uh, true parameters or, or the true proportions of mutations falling in these, these different, different bins. And so that gives us some confidence that both the method is working and also the sample size that, that we're, we, we're considering here, which is about 1,300 individuals, that that actually does contain a lot of power to um, resolve the, the, uh, the DFE. So what we then did was we looked at uh, a variety of these large scale data sets. So I'm starting here with uh, the LUCAMP data. This was the Danish resequencing uh, a set of about 1,300 individuals. And, and what Bernard did was fit essentially different distributions. So a gamma distribution, a neutral plus gamma. That means there's some proportion of mutations are neutral and the remainder, remainder follow a gamma distribution. And so we estimate both the neutral proportion and the parameters of the gamma distribution. And this one here is neutral, lethal, and then some class in the middle that follow an exponential distribution. And then an arbitrary discrete distribution where we had, I, if I'm remembering right, five different bins of the frequency spectrum, we estimated the proportions in, in uh, or excuse me, not the, the DFE, not the frequency spectrum. We estimated the proportions of mutations in each of those. And so what we're showing here is the log likelihoods for these models. They're sort of directly hard to compare because, right, these aren't nested models and the number of parameters in them differ. So we used AIC as a way to at least crudely rank the different models. And what you see for the LUCAMP data set is that the neutral plus gamma model has the best AIC, and from that we infer about 15% of new mutations are neutral, and the rest follow this particular gamma distribution. When we look at the 1,000 genomes data, so this is again the European individuals, we find actually that for here the discrete distribution does the best, but the gamma and neutral plus gamma are pretty similar in AIC, so um, it's difficult to distinguish them, but again this, this model here of neutral, lethal, and exponential in the middle doesn't fit very well. And we move on to the ESP data. Again, we see the neutral plus gamma does, does the best um, of the three with the gamma coming in second. So, you know, that's maybe somewhat interesting, but what I think is more informative is to actually look at the proportions of mutations that fall in the different bins. And so that's what I'll walk you through in the next few slides. So this is just to orient you what was inferred in Boyko et al. in the 2008 paper, where again, we have our bins of the frequency spectrum and the proportions of mutations falling in each bin. So that's the old estimates. Now when we look at um, our estimates with the 1,000 genomes data, we find what's shown here in red. Now there's two different red bars indicating different mutation rates that we're using here. So the dark red matches what Boyko used. The lighter red indicates what we think is sort of a revised estimate of the mutation rate that we, we were more comfortable with and think, you know, in light of new information over the last you know, few years and controversies about mutation rate, we think is the better 
uh, estimate, but we're including the ones that Boyko used just to have a fair uh, comparison to see, you know, is that what may account for differences? And so the first thing that you notice is this bin here. This is the strongly deleterious uh, mutation bin. And what you notice is we infer fewer strongly deleterious mutations than Boyko at all. The mutation rate does make a difference, although even when you use the same mutation rate, we still infer fewer strongly deleterious mutations and more essentially nearly neutral mutations than what Boyko at all found. When we now turn to the ESP data, again, the different colors indicate the different, or the different shades of blue indicate the different mutation rates. But again, what you can see is that we infer fewer strongly deleterious mutations than Boyko at all. And when we move to the LUCAMP data, um, again, two different mutation rates. But again, we consistently find fewer strongly deleterious mutations than what was found in Boyko at all, and more of them found in the other bins of the, uh, of the distribution of, of fitness effects. And so, for example, just to sort of orient you, Boyko, the, the estimate that people typically use when they think about strongly deleterious mutations in humans is Boyko at all about 35%. But based on our data, we think it's at, you know, between third, 20 and 30%. So we think there was this overestimate estimate of the proportion of strongly deleterious mutations in the um, Boyko et al. study. So OK, that was the, you know, those, that's what our estimates of the DFE look like. Well, how do our estimates compare to the Lee et al. study? So if you recall, the Lee et al. study, um, well, actually, what I'm indicating here with the red dots would be the proportions of mutations found in the different bins from the Lee et al. study. And, you know, obviously, Lee et al. had, if you remember, no strongly deleterious mutations. Obviously, we're not um, finding no strongly deleterious mutations here. Yes, we find fewer than Boyko et al., but it's certainly not zero. Uh, and we're not finding 80% in this bin over here. So you might, so on, on the face of it, our estimates don't, do not seem, they seem to differ from Lee et al., but you might say, well, maybe, you know, maybe there's a problem with our inference scheme, and under the Lee et al. distribution, we can't like, actually infer that. And so what we did was simulate, actually, under the Lee et al. distribution, shown here in red, and then say, well, can we recover the Lee et al. DFE if that's the true DFE? And the box plots here indicate that, yes, in fact, we actually uh, can recover the uh, Lee et al. DFE if, in fact, you know, there really are a ton of these uh, moderately deleterious mutations. We'd be able to estimate that with our framework. So it suggests, in fact, that um, you know, it's, it's not a feature of our method that's, that's, uh, caused, or that explains why uh, our, our estimates differ from those, those of Lee et al. So in summary for this part of my talk, across the three different data sets, we find the neutral plus gamma distribution best fits. We predict you know, fewer strongly deleterious mutations than in Boyko et al. Our DFEs differ from those at Lee et al. There could be any number of reasons relating to it, but Lee et al., I think the two sort of most important ones are that Lee et al. considered more common variants, those greater than a few percent, because they, because of, you know, issues with next generation sequencing data in the, in like 2009, to in the earlier days, you know, you couldn't re reliably estimate what was going on with the rarer variants. And so they, you know, reasonably so considered variants that had a few percent frequency in the population. And they also, their method of inference considered only the curvature of the frequency spectrum and didn't use information about the monomorphic sites. And that actually does convey a, uh, a fair bit of information here, and, and, and that could limit some of the power um, as well. So in our view, these new estimates, the DFE, should be more reliable for either evolutionary or medical genetic uh, inferences. And you know, we're in the process of, of you know, we want people to use these estimates, and so we're in the process of making parameter files for the sort of commonly used forward simulation programs so that you know, that won't be an uh, impediment to, uh, to using these, these new estimates. And so we're going to be making those, those available um, as, as soon as we finish it. Um, so lastly, I'm going to sort of, again, focusing on the DFE, but address a slightly different topic. And that pertains to, rather than saying, you know, we focused on gamma or neutral plus gamma distribution, but why, why should the DFE look like a neutral plus gamma or, or, or a gamma distribution? In other words, why is the DFE even what it is in a particular species? What factors drive the evolution of the difference, uh, distribution of fitness effects? And so, it turns out this actually isn't a new question. There's been a, a fair bit of, of theory um, that's been developed on this, and some of it's been applied to um, some uh, mutation accumulation experiments or, or to uh, essentially like microorganisms and, and some studies in ex or some organisms in an experimental system, but it hasn't really been tested with data from natural populations. So just to orient you conceptually to some of these models, I want you to imagine, just for the sake of, of discussion for the next couple minutes, that we can think about we have two species here, right? And we have one species that maybe is highly complex. And so here, complexity, right, is something that's hard to define. But 
as an operational definition for, for our discussion today, we might think about it as like number of protein-protein interactions or perhaps a multicellular organism versus, say, yeast, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and so this, let's imagine this one species is highly complex and has a small population size. So we could think like humans and compared to other species tend to, maybe we can say, fit that bill, small population size and high complexity. The second species, for the sake of this discussion for the next few moments, let's say has lower complexity and maybe has a larger population size. And so we could say Drosophila might be an example there. Certainly, the evidence suggests they have a much larger population size than humans. Yes? They don't have to be, yeah, but, but, and, 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 but that is a very reasonable question that they could. So for the sake of discussion here, we'll keep them together, but then we'll add in some other species that differ in one or the other um, in, in a few minutes. Yes. Only that species, not implied. I two yeah, varieties. exactly, yeah, exactly. So you can imagine, right, there's a few different models about how fitness effects could be the same or different between these, these species with these properties. So probably the most basic null model would be, well, protein function determines what fitness effects are. And so if a protein is really important, right, it'll be more conserved. It'll be under strong purifying selection. It'll have, you know, be mutations in it will be really deleterious. And, you know, presumably that's going on in both these species. So you might predict that the distribution of little s would be the same in both species. And it's determined by proteins. So that's probably the simplest null model. There's another school of thought that says, well, it's really not protein function that's important, but actually making thermodynamically stable proteins that's actually important. You don't want to make proteins that misfold, and then you have to degrade them and then have all this other uh, stuff happen. And so it's really protein folding that's driving um, you know, what's going on with, with, with fitness effects in, in different species. And it turns out that under some conditions, that model actually predicts not that S would be the same in both species, but actually that NS, in other words, the population scaled selection coefficient, would be the same in both species. And the intuition for, you know, that may seem counterintuitive at first, but the intuition behind it is, is the following. It's that selection is more effective in really big populations. So, okay, so big populations mean N is bigger, right? And if selection is really effective, it means you're making really good stable proteins. And so if you make really stable proteins, then when you put new mutations in, you're probably not going to screw them up that much. And so what that means is, is S will be fairly neutral. So S will be small, N will be big. But then in the other species, right, where you have small population size, well, N is smaller. That's sort of the obvious half. But then you're making your selections not as effective. You're not really making good proteins anymore. And so now when you throw mutations in, they can have an effect on fitness and they can get screwed up. So N is small, but then S is big. And under certain conditions, these effects essentially cancel, cancel each other out. And so then NS ends up being the same in both species. A third model that was, I would say, pioneered by, well, certainly suggested by Kimura and, 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 and has been sort of seen in other, uh, uh, or postulated in other, other arenas, is that more complex species ought to have more neutral mutations. And less complex species would have more strongly deleterious mutations, simply because right, the more complex species, you've got mechanisms to buffer out the effects of deleterious mutations. Or you can compensate for them, or you have other sorts of things going on. And so you'd predict more deleterious mutations in the um, l less complex species. And lastly is a model called Fisher's geometric model, which I'll explain the details of in, in a few minutes. But for now, the, the key idea here is that it's kind of the opposite of the mutational robustness prediction. And that is, is that more complex species will tend to have more deleterious mutations or have a more deleterious strength of selection on average. And the key intuition there is, is OK, you have a complicated thing. You, know, you throw a mutation, and it's more likely to break stuff, whereas the simpler thing is just more, more robust because it has fewer parts. I mean, think, think about your car, for, for example. Um, so the key insight from all of that is that we have these different factors. And all of them make different predictions about how the distribution of fitness effects might vary between species that differ in terms of complexity and population size. And so the idea is, is well, we can then compare the DFE between species that differ in terms of complexity and population size using data, polymorphism data from natural populations to try to tease apart which of those factors is actually des best describing what's going on um, in the DFE across multiple natural populations of, of different species. And so this is work that was done by Christian Huber, a uh, postdoc uh, in my group. And so what we started with was comparing the fitness, distribution of fitness effects between humans and Drosophila. And so I'm showing you here sort of our, our, our main results where 
So here's inferring, so we started by inferring a gamma distribution. We looked at other distributions as well, uh, but I don't have time to sort of go into all those details. But the basic idea is, is so these are our two parameters of the gamma distribution. And for humans, this is what we, what we infer. And Drosophila, this is what we infer. The key idea here is, or, or one important point is, we're thinking here in terms of the scale parameters in terms of s, little s, not the population scaled selection coefficient. And so, right, if you, under the assumption that variants in both species are independent of each other, which is in this case fairly reasonable because these are, you know, very long uh, diverged, right, we can come up with a combined log likelihood of, of the data under a full model where each species has its own DFE. We can then look at a restricted model where we constrain the DFE to be the same in both species and then infer what would the parameters of, of that DFE be to be if they're constrained in both species. And by the way, sorry, these are the log likelihood surfaces here, if, if that wasn't obvious, with the points indicating the, the um, MLEs. And so the restricted model, here's the log likelihood. And you can see, right, that it's almost an order of magnitude worse uh, in terms of uh, the restricted log likelihood compared to the, uh, the full model where each species has its own DFE. And that, right, would give rise to a you know, very substantial improvement in, in model fit. And if you want to say, well, why, you know, what exactly is going on there? What do the distributions look like between the two different species? So, well, that's what I'm showing here, where, again, this is like our distribution of fitness effects. And blue is for humans. Red is what we infer in Drosophila. The gray is what we infer under the uh, constrained or restricted model. And the key idea here is, is you can see that the, in humans, we infer more strongly deleterious mutations than in, in uh, Drosophila. And in Drosophila, we infer substantially more mutations that essentially are nearly neutral compared, compared to humans. So you might say, oh, you know, come on, Kirk, there's different population sizes. You know, how, you know, how your method maybe works really well in humans and sucks in Drosophila or vice versa. Or, you know, there's just some statistical artifact. I don't like PRF theory, blah, blah, blah. You know, it assumes things are independent. Maybe that's more true in humans than in Drosophila. So, you know, I, I just don't believe it. Well, we did an extensive amount of simulations. And I wish Eliezer was, were here, because I'd say this is what we were using Hoffman for for the last you know, six months. Uh, it's sort of summarized on here. So I included this in for his, for his benefit. Uh, but the basic idea is we actually did full forward simulations with linkage, recombination rates, and, and distributions of functional elements actually mirroring what's going on in Drosophila and in humans, and said, OK, what if we take the DFE we infer for Drosophila in red and humans in blue. So these are the crosshairs represent sort of the true DFEs in both species. We simulate data, then estimate, um, estimate that. And you can see here, the, here's the distributions of our estimates. We are able to accurately do that. Plot B is probably more, or more important. It's saying, well, what if the null model is true? Let's simulate data under the null. Do we, by, you know, by accident, by chance, or some other statistical bias, you know, infer that Drosophila will go here, or excuse me, humans go here, and Drosophila will go here. We'll know, in fact, we actually, if the true model is the same, even with the different demographies, different recombination rates, yada, yada, we still are able to accurately infer that the um, constrained model or the restricted model is, is the true model. Lastly, you might say, well, you know, okay, you used a, you know, chi -square you know, the chi-square approximation for likelihood ratio tests in the last slide. I don't believe that because the SNPs aren't independent. Well, we can actually look at the null distribution of the uh, likelihood ratio test um, from our simulated data. That's what's shown in red. And yeah, you're right. It doesn't actually follow the asymptotic chi-square two degrees of freedom. But the important point is, is that we never see anything that approaches the value that we empirically see despite our 300 um, simulation replicates. So it suggests, in fact, that you know, yes, even though the asymptotics don't really hold, it doesn't actually matter here because the difference that we see in the real data is far exceeds anything that we see um, in the simulations. So given we were quite confident, given these results, that in fact the difference in DFE between humans and Drosophila is indeed real. And so for the last part of my talk, I'll quickly go through the different models to test wh which one uh, can explain this difference. So the first obvious null model is that, well, S is the same in both species. And we can easily, we already rejected that essentially by everything I just showed you. Um, so that one's done. The next model is that predicts, the protein folding model predicts that NS will be the same uh, between species. And so we can test that sort of by doing the same thing we just did uh, with the likelihood ratio test framework. But now instead of considering the uh, just little s, we can do the inference uh, or do the comparison, I should say, of the NS values across the different species. And so I'll you know, more quickly go through that. But again, here's our, our, the full model. These are the values of NS that we infer. And we can come up with the combined likelihood of that and then do the same thing with the restricted model. And again, you see that the restricted model has you know, a couple orders of magnitude worse fit compared to the 
um, the full model. And what I think is probably more, more intuitive and more helpful to understanding this is to actually compare the distribution of NS. And what we see is that in Drosophila, the distribution of NS is much greater than, than in humans. In other words, there are substantially more mutations with 2NS, sorry, greater than 100 in Drosophila compared to humans in blue. And humans have more nearly neutral mutations when you think about it on the NS uh, scale. And so that suggests we can reject a model where NS is the same between species. And that rejects at least sort of the uh, vanilla incarnation of this uh, protein folding model. Third model, mutational robustness. That predicts that right, we should see more strongly deleterious mutations in the less complex species. So in that case, we've rejected that model already too, because the uh, average selection coefficient is larger in humans, the putatively more complex species. So in other words, the sign is going the wrong direction. So that leaves us with Fisher's geometric model. And how does that stack up to the data? Well, Quickly, just by uh, way of introduction, Fisher's geometric model looks, it's a nice conceptual model for thinking about fitness effects in different species and that sort of thing. It's fairly general. Um, there's some support from different uh, um, experimental systems for it, but in terms of natural populations with higher organisms, it hasn't really been tested in this framework, and that we think is one of the interesting strengths of our, our study. But the basic idea behind it is the following. So we have some optimal um, uh, phenotype that has the best fitness. That's denoted in the crosshair here. And then an actual population is sum summarized by this, this dot here. And it can either be at the optimum or some other space. So the idea is there's, this is a two-dimensional space, right? And then the phenotypes have, there's essentially two phenotypes under selection in this diagram. Of course, it can be more than two in, in real life and in the model, but just for this cartoon, it's, it's two-dimensional. And the idea is, is that mutations will pull you in some direction. They'll either move you uh, or they'll move you somewhere away from your current value. And they can either take you towards the optimum, at which point they'll be adaptive or advantageous because you're improving in fitness, or they'll take you further from the optimum. And in that case, they'll be deleterious. And that's what's shown in this, this dark circle here. And so it turns out that this, this model actually has, has some nice um, theory that was largely published in these two papers, among others, but that actually allows this, this conceptual model to make predictions about what the distribution of fitness effects of mutations might look like. And keep in mind, that's the thing we're interested in measuring right from our, from our data. And so there's actually some theory that directly ties this conceptual thing to, to um, what you might see in terms of distributions of fitness effects. And some of this is, is a bit elegant in that the way that these, the theory uh, postulates is that the distribution of fitness effects from Fisher's geometric model is largely determined by what they consider complexity and pleiotropy. So complexity would be the number of traits or phenotypes under selection. And the pleiotropy is the number of, um, essentially the number of um, phenotypes affected by, by a mutation. And so the idea is, is this theory then allows us to make some conceptual uh, predictions about what we might expect the distributions of fitness effects to look like or things we can test with our data. And that's what I'll tell you about for the last part of, of the talk here. So the first prediction is that more complex organisms should have more deleterious mutations than less complex organisms. So we've already tested this in terms of the human and Drosophila comparison. That sort of was what the main result I started with. And that was that humans have more strongly deleterious mutations compared to Drosophila. That supports what we find. But you might say, well, you know, there's other differences between humans and Drosophila. So what about other, other species? And a reviewer of this paper sort of asked, asked us that. And so Christian went back and did a fair bit of work and actually also looked at yeast and mice and sort of found polymorphism data from those species and applied the same approach that, and I'll spare all the details of it. But basically what this graph here shows is for these different species arranged in order of complexity. So maybe you don't think fly, humans are more complex than flies, but they're certainly more complex than yeast. I hope we can all agree on that at least, um, hopefully. Um, and, and the y-axis here shows the average uh, strength of selection uh, uh, acting on deleterious mutations. And so what we find here is, in fact, there is this trend of increasing, or what we think is increase, increasing complexity. There is this trend of um, increasing deleteriousness of, of mutations. And that's consistent with what we would predict from Fisher's, uh, from Fisher's geometric model. So that's the first prediction that holds up in our data. The second prediction has to do with pleiotropy. And that is that less pleiotropic mutations, in other words, over here, will have a more strongly skewed uh, distribution of fitness effects. In other words, less pleiotropic mutations have a bigger variance in terms of their, their fitness effects. That comes out from, from the model compared to more pleiotropic genes. And 
So you might say measuring pleiotropy right is a bit difficult. Um, so what we did, and I, we're not the first to do this, is we can look at gene expression patterns and say, well, we can use the degree of tissue specificity as a measure of, of pleiotropy. And the idea is tissue-specific genes may be less pleiotropic compared to broadly expressed genes that are more pleiotropic. So the idea is we can now take in Drosophila and humans, parse the genes into tissue-specific versus broadly expressed categories, and repeat this whole process of estimating the DFE for both categories and look at what the estimates look like. And so that's what I'm showing you here when we consider all the genes together, right? So this is showing the estimates of the shape parameter of the gamma distribution. And the idea is, is the smaller the shape parameter, the more skewed the distribution is. So the bigger the, bigger the, the, uh, the variance here is. And so the key idea is, is in both in Drosophila and in humans, if you look at the broadly expressed genes, they're less skewed than the tissue. They have less skewed distribution of fitness effects compared to the tissue specific. Or let me say that the other way. The tissue specific genes tend to be, have a more skewed distribution of um, selection coefficients compared to the broadly expressed. And that holds if you stratify by expression level sort of overall shown in all these other plots. And so the idea is these lower estimates of alpha and the tissue specific genes, that's a prediction from the Fisher's geometric model regarding pleiotropy. And so that's borne out with our data as well. The last prediction is that species with small population sizes should have a higher proportion of beneficial mutations. And you might say, well, why, why does that make sense? Um, so here's the intuition behind that prediction. That is that small population size, right, you can have fixation of weakly deleterious mutations. That provides then an opportunity, so that pushes in Fisher's geometric model the population further from the optimum because you're accumulating these deleterious mutations so you move away from the optimal fitness. That then provides the opportunity for new beneficial mutations to bring the population back to the optimum. And so the idea is then you should have a DFE that includes slightly more uh, beneficial mutations. And so what Christian did here was actually take our polymorphism data, and it turns out this concept actually has been um, put into a theoretical framework for what the um, distribution of fitness effects would look like, including beneficial mutations, as a function of the population size. And this is long-term population size, so not the typical 4N generations that we think of in population genetics that describes the population size in terms of the amount of genetic variation we see, but even deeper time over which the distribution of fitness effects might evolve. And so when Christian uh, uh, did this, this, these estimates, he comes up with estimates in the thousands for the human lineage and estimates in the, uh, in the millions for the Drosophila lineage. And I think that's quite remarkable that this sort of difference in the uh, uh, population size between these because that's, uh, you know, broadly speaking, in agreement with what we would predict from, from, from other studies of genetic variation data of more recent population history that humans tend to have had historic effective sizes of thousands in Drosophila in, in the millions. And the other thing that we infer from this is that indeed we predict humans will have a greater proportion of beneficial mutations. So we infer about 15%, but the bulk of these are very weakly beneficial. So it's not that there's lots of positive selection, but rather they're almost in the nearly neutral range, but just over the positive selection coefficient, or just over the um, neutral line here. Uh, whereas in Drosophila, we tend not to, to see those um, as well, or, or not see those as much. And I think that's particularly interesting in light of other literature that seeks to quantify, essentially looking at the proportion of amino acid substitutions that were driven by positive selection, you actually get the opposite pattern. Uh, where you see that you would think there's more adaptive evolution in Drosophila, but in this framework, it actually predicts you'd have more weakly beneficial mutations in humans. And that's maybe something that, that hasn't, I think, been um, appreciated as, as much. So in conclusion, the naive assumption about constancy of distributions of S across species doesn't seem to hold. Um, we think the selection is stronger in, uh, or excuse me, the average selection coefficient is more deleterious in humans compared to Drosophila. And adding in other species largely um, supports that, that prediction. We see a stronger skew in the DFE in genes that are tissue specific, and that more broadly suggests that, you know, including uh, estimating DFEs for different, you know, expression categories might be a useful thing to do if you're interested in, you know, in particularly medical applications or other sorts of things, that, that might be useful. Uh, and our results, you know, sort of most broadly suggest complexity and population size are the key factors that driving the DFE across different species. And, you know, it doesn't mean that all the predictions of the other models, you know, are, are wrong or don't apply. It just means that in terms of the dominant factors driving the evolution of the DFE, you know, across these, these sort of uh, organisms in natural populations, we think that it's Fisher's geometric model best sort of captures that in a parsimonious framework. And these other factors could have second order effects or be maybe applicable for certain cases of genes or maybe in microorganisms or other sorts of studies or organisms we didn't consider here.
So I'd like to thank the people actually in my group who actually did the work, Bernard mainly for the inference of the DFE in large samples, and Christian for, the, uh, for the, his work on the um, inference of the DFE across species. Other folks in my lab played key roles in that as well and certainly contributed input uh, uh, quite, quite frequently. I'd like to thank also the funding agencies for uh, keeping, this, keeping this going. So thanks, I'd be happy to take questions if you're not anxious for lunch. Thank you.